Hello, I'm Anna De La Vega and welcome to my second episode of Flute Reboot on Adagio Live, the place where classical music happens. And you can tune in every evening for chats and masterclasses from your favorite classical musicians um, around the world. So a short recap. In the first episode, we discovered the flute is the oldest instrument in the world with findings dating to 43,000 BC. Um, if you, 43,000 years ago, if you think um, Tutankhamun was doing his thing like 1300 BC, that's unbelievable. So um, how it has appeared also, we learned remarkably in almost every culture and ethnic group since then, as well as in fables and storytelling and religions throughout time. Um, but really significantly, that is, it has been attributed um, almost unanimously um, powers of influence and temptation, even shamanistic powers. But we didn't talk about why. The flute is the closest instrument to the human voice. This is very significant. It's the only instrument which does not rely on the contact between two elements to produce sound. So the sound is produced by air blowing across a hole and then vibrating in a chamber. Every other instrument requires contact or friction between two parts. So a bow on a string or a reed in a mouth, such as the oboe or the clarinet, or a mouthpiece like with trumpet or horn. So the flute really stands alone in that sound is produced similarly to, to singing, uninterrupted air. So one could say when man was searching beyond the body to produce sound, and obviously it began with, with singing and clapping, it was a simple instinctual progression to take a reed or a leaf or a hollow bone and blow in it, an extension almost of the voice. So, I mean, if you're a caveman in your cave, would you do that? Or would you get a wood and um, tie some rabbit intestines to it and then cut off your horse's tail and tie that to a twig, rub it on some tree sap and then scrape that, the horse hair, over the intestines, hoping it resonates in the wood, right? So stringed instruments. Or would you, like your mates in the local pub, grab your beer bottle and have a blow? So uh, now I am going to destroy my career for the sake of demonstration and play you Mary Had a Little Lamb on Germany's finest Kombacher beer bottles. Mm -hmm. anyone says coronavirus hasn't changed the life of classical musicians then we have another thing coming so I mean if I were a caveman I would go for that option rather than the rabbit horsetail option right so this simplicity can perhaps explain why it pops up everywhere simultaneously in regards to the flute being linked with mythological or spiritual figures with death and deity likewise its closeness to the human voice uninterrupted sound waves gives it the capacity um, to resonate with us almost primordially, maneuver us, draw us in, you know, like the singing voice of, of our mother. It can enter and speak so directly. So now to this episode, consort to court. Um, we saw that the very first transverse flute, as opposed to the recorder, migrated to Europe with the Byzantine traders. So now I'm going to, here we have the earliest image of transverse flute um, is in an Orthodox cathedral in Kiev, Ukraine, which was originally built by the Byzantine masters dating from 11th century. And it's absolutely beautiful. Um, then we talked about the second wave of interest in the transverse flute, which was with the Swiss mercenaries, essentially a Renton army who was, you know, went all over Europe and their main signaling instrument was the transverse flute. And then we come to the Renaissance flute out of that, which is essentially a, a you know, a shepherd's whistle. It's very simple. It's a one piece wooden 
um, instrument with six holes and a very small mouthpiece, a mouth hole here. And it comes in different sizes, which I will talk about later. But in this episode, what we're, what we're focusing on is the one most significant thing that happened in the life of the transverse flute. And that was its transition from this Renaissance flute to this, the one keyed traverso flute um, this one by Hotter in three parts. So um, uh, the Renaissance flute. When an instrument is in one piece, you can't tune it to other instruments. It's fixed. You tune an instrument by lengthening or shortening it at the joins. So the flute could not easily play chamber music um, with an instrument which was not built to play together. So this limited travel because in Europe at this time, there was no standardized pitch. So if your flute was made to play with an organ in Hamburg, you can't just like rock down to Munich and expect to play with the organ in Munich. In fact, it couldn't even play with other flutes um, unless they were flutes from the same set of instruments made together to be played together. Now these sets of flutes were called consorts. And another reason for the sets was that the transverse flutes that at this time, the Renaissance flutes I showed you had such a limited range that different flutes were built at different pitches. You saw the smaller ones, the larger ones, so that combined they could play the whole range of notes needed. Now, one last mind blowing detail on the Renaissance flute is that the tone holes, so where you place your fingers, which determine the tone you're playing, were placed according to the anatomy of the player. So it was like, oops, the king, you know, cut off my finger, it's too short now. Oh, don't worry, we'll just drill the G hole there instead. I mean, you can imagine how crazy this, this tuning must have been, how difficult to combine that with other instruments. So here I'm going to show you um, a flute consort. Um, played by modern day people, I'm sharing here. <laughs> So that, um, and now we're focusing on the transition and this is where. So that is where we're going. And this was the most important thing that has happened and the focus of, of this episode. So how and why did the flute evolve? I learned something fascinating a couple of years ago that really stuck with me. And that was that man throughout history has evolved himself and, and made inventions for only two reasons. If he is cold or due to the threat of an enemy. So in the case of the flute, they weren't cold, but there was an enormous new threat. Enter the violin. So around the mid 1500s, the great Italian violin makers who we still marvel and celebrate today began their exquisite work then and for the next hundred years. Salò, Amati, Stradivari, Guarnieri. And it was um, Andrea Amati who perfected the form of the violin at this time, which, which has barely changed since. Um, so this unbelievable tradition of violin making exploded in Northern Italy. And these instruments, of course, spread um, throughout Europe. So with better powerful violins, with richer sounds came better players and the violin moved from being a peasant's folk instrument, largely for accompanying dance into an instrument considered a real profession. It, it became an amateur instrument of the upper classes and it started to appear in court and in church. It was an enormous uh, change. Now, imagine here you have the consort of flutes, hard to play with other instruments, can't tune them, 
have to travel in you know, a pack of flutes from the same set. And each instrument can only manage a very small range. And then walk in the violin, a tonal range like Mariah Carey, they can play four notes at once, um, tune to almost any pitch, comparatively enormous sound. And the players inspired by the new developments and, and sound of these beautiful Italian instruments could rip up and down with much greater virtuosity. So a revolution in flute making had to take place and it did in the second half of the 17th century. So there were three major changes. Its body was divided into three parts, allowing it now to be able to be tuned. It gained a conical bore rather than a cylindrical bore. So in the PDF I showed you, the Renaissance flute was even, the same diameter all the way down. The Baroque flute became conical, so larger and tapering off at the end. Now, this was significant because it, it, it improved the intonation, it increased the volume, especially in the lower notes, and it was, it's actually easier to hold when you have a little bit more meat up the top, so to say, and it was just became better suited to, to have as a, with, for a role as a solo instrument. It was more flexible, um, but the, the really fundamental difference was that they added that one key for the right hand pinky. Um, which essentially meant the flute was now chromatic. This is the, the um, E flat D sharp key today, but it, so the flute could now play um, the whole row, um, range. So while it's hard to pinpoint exactly where this happened, it is widely agreed that Jacques Hotter, court composer and flute player to um, King Louis XIV of France was instrumental um, to the revolution, this revolution in flute history. So at Versailles at this time, King Louis had four um, main court composers. There was uh, Couperin, uh, Lalonde, Protater and Lully. So not a bad lineup of Frenchies, I would say. So, um, I mean, actually, the musical activities in Versailles um, under um, Louis XIV is instrumental to the whole development of Western classical music, because there was something called um, what well, Lully, one of those four composers, was responsible for what is now considered the origins of the modern orchestra. Um, that was Les 24 Violons du Roi, the 24 violins of the king. And this was founded in 1626 under Louis XIII, and it even spread um, to England. Um, Henry I had an exact um, replication of this, the 24 violins. Um, and Lully uh, also then created the Petit Violon, which is just essentially, you know, the little violins, a, a smaller group. So that was essentially the first orchestra. Now, who knows how it came about, but with Hotter and Lully there together in Versailles, and Hotter now saddled with his new and improved transverse flute, in 1681, we have the first orchestral score which specifically requests transverse flute to play. And this was Lully's own composition, uh, Le Triomphe de la Mort. And um, there we have the first official invitation for the flute into the orchestra in, at, at this time. So soon after the first works for flute appeared, for solo flute, composers began to take an interest and it really mushroomed from there. Um, but the flute's real stamp um, of approval, um, its launch pad into this new role as a truly solo instrument of the Western classical music tradition was yet to come. And that was when a 36 year old man in Weimar, Germany, took his feather and ink and included the flute in his milestone work. And that was Johann Sebastian Bach and his Brandenburg concertos. So thank you for joining me and please come back next week on Adagio Live for episode three of Flute Reboot, which is Bach's Brandenburg bombshell. So thank you and see you soon. Take care.